Hey Rankin, how are you? I'm good, thank you. It's good to how see you? you. How are you? How are you? I'm fine, very well. Um, counting down the days to getting back to some kind of a uh, human contact, but everyone well, hopefully on your side of the screen. All good this side, thank you. Right. So tell me, while we um, are going to work through a few questions and um, thoughts that have emerged over the last eight weeks, how, how's the last uh, few weeks been for you in terms of um, adjusting to what is a very new world order? Oof, so that's, a, that's a big question. Um, it's been a combination of like, loss of lots and lots and lots of work because obviously my job involves you know being very close to people and i can't ha do half of my job if i'm not in the same room as someone um very productive because i've been photographing still lives for the last 60 days or something um and then on the kind of agency creative side we've been been really really busy so very strange and very privileged. I'm in a house in the country. It's very, it's beautiful. I feel very separate. So separate in the fact that I kind of had to offer my services to the NHS and I've just been doing some NHS shoots, uh, which is our national health service shoots. And um, that's the first time I went out. I went out last week and I went out the last couple of days and it was strange. To wow. say the least. Yeah. Tell me, you, um, your last issue of Hunger was um, about the future, which in itself was very pertinent, <laughs> given that, uh, you know, you, you also chose to feature products in the issue, which were all secondhand. And, you know, there's something quite interesting about the two things hand in hand in terms of the future in the most grandiose kind of future of the planet, future of the world, but also this idea of, you know, sustainability, responsibility, etc. And um, there was a comment you made at the end of your um, introduction, which said, the future exists right now, you just have to want to see it. Um, talk me through that a little bit in terms of not just the inspiration for the issue being about the future, but how you kind of unpack that statement about the future being here and now and around us? Well, I've been a very big critic of what the digital revolution has brought us negatively. So things like, things like, um, you know, uh, our, our addiction to uh, the smartphone, our addiction to social media. I've been very, very critical of that. And in a lot, a lot of ways, we didn't see that coming um, as a kind of um, a culture, as, a, a, as human beings. Uh, we accepted everything that was given to us. We thought it was fantastic. And actually, the way that my head thinks about it now is that we're, we're very much kind of in a world that's turned upside down. So it's like, the industrial revolution, the invention of you know the combustion engine, the invention of the printing press have all happened in the last you know five to ten years, and we we're all kind of looking at the world through the lens of yesterday still. And my comment on the future was, what's going to be next is definitely things like virtual reality and mixed reality, and we're kind of taking it for granted that that's going to be fine as well, and it. It, it, and it definitely isn't going to be fine. It's going to cause so many problems um, with our commerce, with our democracy. I mean, our democracy is being torn apart by social media. So my uh, intention was to say, like, let's start considering and thinking about what's going to be next. Because in a way, the kind of big, the big um, social platforms like Facebook and Twitter and and even Amazon, if you, you know, works as a kind of social platform itself as well. They're not really that interested in what's going on now because they're all thinking about 5, 10, 15 years from now. And we're just dealing with now. And I'm, what I'm saying is let's get ahead of that. Let's get ahead of it and, and consider it and start having debates and discussions with them because um, our governments are definitely not. Um, I mean, maybe 
there's a really great quote, um, and it's, I think it's by someone awful, but for, for decades, nothing can happen. And then if, within a few weeks, decades can happen. Mm. And what's happened mm. with this is within a few weeks, decades have happened. And our, our governments have not been set up and ready for this for a while. Um, and especially the American government. And, and I think that, that, you know, we've got this potential now. And obviously when we did the issue, I was going, we were running into this. It, it, it was obvious it was going to happen or something was going to happen. And we were just thinking in terms of, let's start thinking and talking about the future now. And in a way which is not, um, you know, let's make it new, fast and new don't really mean, have the same meaning anymore. They kind of make people nervous. So now we've all been told to slow down, which for me is like a slap in the face from Earth saying, you know, stop it. You know, th this will be bad for you if you don't stop it. And we've been made to stop. And, um, and that's what I was kind of saying in the, in, the, in the intro was, look, we need to start talking about everything in a futuristic way, because if we don't, then, um, you know, we'll just get into the same trouble that we've just got into. And, and in yeah. terms of clothes, it was just, I just wanted to make a point that, you know, I'm, I, I'm, not a, I'm not trying to make a political statement, like, you know, new clothes are bad. I don't think that's, that's actually right. I think the way that we consume clothes is, is makes me very nervous. And I, I just was trying to say, look, you can use, archive or you can use things that have been in your you can you can reinvent clothes and um and i think that actually the fact weirdly the fashion industry is starting to do that much much more than it's ever done before so i'm not i kind of feel that we're, we're as, as a community much more responsible than people think we are uh, or some of us are i should say I, I think it's a great point i mean i think what's interesting about everything you've just said is that you're shedding, you know, you're, you're putting a light on ranking the, the person. And of course, you're known, you know, throughout the world for the incredible work and body of work that you've been shooting for, you know, over two, almost three decades now. And, you know, this kind of slightly uh, sort of superficial and over-consumed, sort of over-consumption-led society and the kind of glossy pages of magazines versus the kind of voice that you have as an individual, which you've often and very, you know, never really shied away from using through other channels, Twitter, for example. Um, does all that mean that actually a magazine like Hunger will become more of a voice um, than just a book full of incredible images? And I talk about that from a perspective of somebody who doesn't work in the industry, who's looking in and going, I've never heard of this magazine. They pick it up and do they, are they confronted with something that just looks like another beautiful, you know, um, selection of images alongside adverts mm. and editorial versus something that yeah. starts becoming a bit more of a voice that says, hang on, this, there's a message here that's a bit more important than where we've just come from. Mm. Well, I think historically from my days at Dazed and Confused right through to, to Hunger, we've always raised these uh, cultural, cultural kind of feelings in what we're doing. We've never shied away ever from having commentary on culture and society and what the architecture of that is and how we can change it. I mean, we, at Dazed and Confused, I kind of laugh when, you know, people are giving, patting people on the back these days for, for having diversity on the cover or, hmm. for, you know, having political commentary within the magazines. We've been doing that since 91. So we've never really stopped, you know. Um, and I mean, my take on fashion has always been, it's, it's a very seductive way to, to kind of get your ideas across. And I'm seduced by it and it's, it's very um, easy to consume and it's very exciting. And if you can get some ideas in there, then why not? Why not push it? Um, but for me, I guess like hunger, I, I, you know, what we did with the latest issue was show that you don't have to buy new clothes to look good. And using that as a, I don't know, just a, a reminder of what it used to be like when we all couldn't afford clothes. Um, and. <laughs>
when fashion wasn't as all consuming as it is now was it was just a, it was just a note really but but if you look at the images they're super super seductive and they sit next to any fashion uh, magazine anywhere but but yeah I've always used fashion I mean I'm I'm in, in a sense I'm not a very good fashion photographer because I don't love fashion the way that real you know like a Merton Marcus or I don't know Mario Testino they love they love it they absolutely love what the seduction is and the kind of quality of the clothes and I've always used it as a way of getting my ideas in and because of that I think um you know, I have great admiration for people that can do it really well. Um, I think it's a really good way of me sneaking a bit of politics in or a bit of, you know, anarchy, you know, wh wh whatever it is. I'm always, there's always a bit of an idea going on with me. And um, I guess that's kind of more coming from a conceptual art point, point of view because that's what I studied at college. So, but I loved the seduction of fashion. I really love, I love magazines. I love looking at them. I love consuming imagery. And I look at those images by other people and I'm like, God, I wish I could do that. But I, it just doesn't, A, I can't, I'm not very good at it. And B, I've always got these ideas going on in my head. We'll, we'll, so, come, on to, we'll, we'll come on to talking about the work and your work, um, because there's so much in there to, to reference, but based on what you just said about fashion versus non. But just before that, just talk me through how you see the role of a print magazine in the future. Because, of course, we all love print. We grew up through an era of analog, and that's not sort of, you know, something that we will necessarily always just look back upon in a sort of, sort of rose-tinted way. You know, there's something brilliant about physical objects and products, but the role of a fashion magazine and a print version is, I think, today fundamentally different to what it was meant mm. to do in the past how do you where how do you see that versus the digital access that you've provided certainly through this issue of hunger being free i think for me fashion magazines magazines in general are something that we should cherish because they're fantastic moments in time that unlike digital even a website yeah, that self-contained thing for me is just, you can't beat it. You can't be working on it, you can't. But, but financially, you know, you ha they have to be subsidized now by digital. You can't, you know, the, the thing about fashion is that so many people see it as an art form, especially people within it, but it's so much about commerce and it's about selling clothes and it's about, making money and and there's nothing wrong with that um you know we've been we've been buying into that for years uh, dazed and another and and hunger but but um the magazine itself now has has lost so much of its relevance in that arena unless you're at the kind of real top of the the pyramid in terms of who you're reaching you know it's not got the same resonance and i think that that creativity, you know, like you used to borrow a piece of, of clothing and then a, a great stylist would put it into a, a concept, a story, a conceptual story or, a, a, you know, a, a trend story. And that was how the fashion consumer understood, you know, the ideas that were within collections and, and how, they, how they relate to them and what the seasonal trends are. And, and it, there's something fantastic about that but it's gone in print you know like it's really you know the best magazines have really really understood that celebrity is what sells now and to 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 turn the celebrity in and make them kind of almost the muse of the magazine for the issue i hate the word muse but that is much more relevant to the audience now than it was when it was a supermodel so I think that, and, and, and really the, the ads, you know, the ads are only reaching thousands of people, you know, whereas the, the, the apps are reaching millions of people. So what I always say to my team is, do you consume your fashion in magazines or do you consume it on social? And all of them consume it on social. So I always say, get, just balance it. Just make sure the balance is right. Don't just put all your energy into the magazine. Of course, it's easy to do that because it's so exciting 
to make a magazine and it's so collaborative but if you let if you do that at the at the mercy of the digital then you know you're you're missing the com commerce element to it and also the com commerce element to the reach of of uh, uh, of your title i mean i think katie grand was one of the first people that really realized this this sort of the how useful celebrity could be to uh, to to get a massive reach much much bigger than the mag her magazine would ever get yeah um, using using i mean supermodels that were you know they're 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 they're, they're kind of not just supermodels they're they're uh, uh, tv celebrities who have become supermodels and and that reach is you can't beat that reach it's millions and millions of people and that's why the the brands will spend money because that reach uh, as a whole package is so incredible and if you if you're just doing a magazine like i always felt that ashley heath made a big mistake by by not getting really into digital because he has such a great connectivity with his uh with his audience and with this with the with his black book and um you know and I, and I think that jefferson was kind of halfway in between so they're kind of, they're my universe and then edward was edwards and and uh, anna like really got it right so to me the they can't be separated anymore that's the thing you can't i love doing a magazine and it is so much fun to make it and get it and hold it and feel it and it's like nothing else. Um, maybe just ma making photos is the only thing that's similar for me or making a film, but, but it's got nowhere near as much kind of, you know, oh God, it just feels so good. But then commercially, who, who's buying them? You know, yeah. they'd know, all the same group of people are buying them, which is even but funnier. As an image maker, and you know, we're talking here about one very specific medium and format being a magazine, but as an image maker, an artist, which I think is better, a better description than a fashion photographer for the reasons you said earlier, you also fairly effortlessly moved from still life and imagery, you know, sort of, uh, photography, sorry, into film. And mm. you've been doing it for years. And of course, you've got a very, you know, uh, fantastic production business um, over a, I did. at your studio. <laughs> well, you did eight weeks ago and it's <laughs> coming back. Don't worry. But, you know, talk me through that narrative that allow, that film allows in terms of, you know, storytelling and all the things that take you back into the art, not just the commerce of what was, you know, as you said, the model for fashion. Mm. Um, I think pr probably I I just always used whichever route I could to reach an audience. That was always my intention. So film was a something when I was a kid. I just I had absolutely I was, I was so scared of it. Really very nervous because it felt like so separate to me. Like you had to be a an expert in it. So when I started doing it, I was kind of asked more. By people to make films and then once I'd done a few I just thought well it's it's not as complicated as I thought it was but then it took me you know from from then about sort of 10 years to learn how to do it properly because it's such a separate medium from photography everyone thinks it's really similar but it's not similar and ca capturing a moment is very different from capturing lots and lots of different moments and putting them together and the comparison I always make is it's, it's like the difference between writing like a short poem and writing a novel, you know, you, it's a totally different skill set. Yes, you're using the same techniques, but it's much, much harder to make a film. Um, but yeah, it, I'm glad you thought it was effortless. I, 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 at the time, didn't feel like it was effortless at all. I felt like it was, I felt it was embarrassing and I was you know wasn't very good at it for quite a while but I, now I think you, your ability to express ideas and creative ideas through film um was always for me a much deeper look into you you as a person and your art you know the pictures are the pictures i mean when you shoot some of the most incredible you know subjects that you've shot from you know the queen to madonna to the rolling Stones, i mean the list is endless the film for me was a little bit more of a sort of expose about 
the kind of working, the inner workings, which I found much more interesting because it allowed me sort of further in. And if I didn't know you, it would have allowed me a little more of a look into your your mind and the mind of an artist. And I think for, for all of us, when you look at a great artists, you're always trying to figure out how does he or she think? What drives them to get to that eventual output? Um, and that's why I thought film looked effortless because it didn't feel like you'd spent, you know, it, it was on, it felt unfiltered. And clearly I'm talking yeah. about work that was, you know, maybe films rather than commercials, just yeah. around a sort of a very strict sort of commercial requirement. But, um, you know, I think film and photography together are, you know, very, I mean, as you said, completely different forms and, you know, yeah. coming from the same place with different techniques and not everyone can do both and many people have shown that it can't be done as easily um but do you um you know when you look at artists and other filmmakers and image makers who where do you get your inspiration like who do you look at beyond i mean it's a greats from the past but do you, you know do you get your inspiration from everywhere from anywhere um i mean i tend to not get inspired too much by other photographers in Filmmakers. I mean, I've done film studies, so I, I did it uh, A level film studies. So I got very, I got very into my uh, history of film, and I know enough about it that I can have an intelligent conversation about it. But, but um, I find that books are more. I find books the most inspiring thing for me because they make, really make me think, and I love reading so much. And obviously, galleries, art, art is a massive inspiration for me. Artists. Um, you know, from really the moment. Um, I'm reading an amazing book called, um, I have to look at, uh, at it because I'm terrible at names. It's by the guy that wrote Moneyball. Oh yeah. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. It's called, um, I'm reading Stephen King, if it bleeds, I love Stephen King, uh, but I'm reading a, a film called The Fifth Risk, which is by a guy called Michael Lewis. Fifth risk. Um, fifth risk, yeah. And I read a lot of those political sort of, it's basically about Trump and how Trump has uh, the, the negligence he's, he's brought to the departments of, of uh, you know, agriculture, all the departments within his, within his, uh, his government. And he has, he's just literally not taken it seriously. So, and he's just going through all the things that he's done wrong. It's quite... It's a bit uh, since you mentioned sad. him, it would be <laughs> sad. <laughs> since you mentioned him, it would be remiss of me not to ask. But you know, you have photographed most of the most incredible people on the planet. Yeah, you got I would definitely vote. You would, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I don't understand why people wouldn't. Yeah, I think it's duty to photograph people. That are, like, that are like that. I photographed Tony Blair, I photographed Gordon Brown, I photographed Gorbachev. I, I love photographing politicians. How was the Queen? They've got very, the Queen was incredible. I mean, the Queen's not a politician. She's a, she's a, she's a, oh. she's a, she's a, um, the, as a, just as a person, she's just absolutely amazing. I, I, I could not be more impressed by her as a human being. And um, she's very funny. She's got a very good sense of humor. Are they the moments when you're there in such a sort yeah. of environment where you go, that's got to be the best thing about Yeah, that's when, you, that's when you pinch yourself. That's when you pinch yourself. And when you're walking into Buckingham Palace and you see the Queen walking down towards you with um, a footman that's, you know, two, two feet taller than two and a half feet taller than her. And that's the moment when she's laughing and you're just going, this is like... Wow. Seen behind the, the curtain, you know, I love that stuff. But then last weekend I was painted by a painter I've never been painted before. And that was one of the most fascinating things to happen to me as well. So I kind of embrace all those, all those really unique, they're the bits that I love, like, you know, going to, I don't know, an amazing location and just going, you know, I would never have come here if, if I, if I didn't do my job. So uh, and I'm, I'm really sad that people think I'm not a kind of uh, location photographer because I really am. I've done lots and lots of it. But I've just got known for doing studio portraits. And I, mean, I love I mean, I've been loving seeing the flowers and the still life. I mean, your, that work recently for me is just 
stunning. You know, it really, I, I really enjoy it. And I think it's something incredibly um, powerful in the sort of, I don't know, maybe even the solitude of those individual flowers that you've been shooting. Yeah. Is that something, clearly you've had time to do some other stuff recently. Is that something you would perhaps move towards? Is that a direction of travel in terms of your photography? Because obviously you are known for portraits. I mean, that's really the, yeah. the sort of, you know, the calling card. Yeah, I mean, the flowers I'd wanted to do for a while. In fact, I've been doing a project with Damien Hurst on the side, which was flower related. And um, he was encouraging me, he, we're not doing it as a collaboration. He was just encouraging me to do something. And, and um, I was working on it sort of, it, but it was more studio based. And then the minute this happened, flowers had just been in my head for like three years. In fact, to the point that I'd collected so many uh, flowers, dried flowers in my office, that all of the uh, team in the office were like, God, you've got to get rid of these flowers, they smell. <laughs> Even my wife now is kind of get rid of these flowers, they stink. Um, yeah. I love them when they're dying uh, or drying um, because they become characters. And I just see all these characters or animals or bats or, you know, in them. And then I kind of create like a world around them and, and photograph them as if they're people. So. I can't help but bring the portraiture and the storytelling uh, to to the the image making. That's just that's it. Obviously, inbuilt now for me. I'm always looking for a story and for a moment. So, but yeah, doing it has been great because I'm on my own. So normally, in a studio, I have. I mean, this probably will stop now, but I'd have at least ten people around me. Right. Even on location, you'd have 10 people around you making these works together. And then doing it on my own was kind of like going back to, to, to college. And I've absolutely loved doing it like so much. I've been burning them and setting uh, dandelions alight. And, which actually yeah. in French means something that you probably know the expression. But to a, 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 a dandelion that's a lot, uh, on fire... It's passion, right? It's pa passion that burned Damn, out. I, think, I wish I knew the French phrase. I need to ask uh, Sonia there about is, that. But, the um, French phrase, the burning dandelion, I think it's called. I will find out and come back to you. You know, I think that's something that's interesting when you said that you apply the same uh, time, dedication, sort of approach as you would to people, because that's maybe what, when I was looking at the pictures, you've just given me the sort of, explanation that you brought these even dried flowers to life they have this yeah. this depth in the whole thing it's not just a dry flower but it's, it's really super interesting and yeah I can't I, and I can't help myself I try and look at them as still lives but then you know I'll see a phallus or I'll see a heart or I'll see an old man or I'll see you know a bat or I keep seeing you know like even when I did two roses the other day, oh no, they were anyway, two flowers and, and one was one way and one the other. And I was like, oh, you know, that's like a relationship in quarantine. I just can't, I mean, it's not very deep, but it's just the way my- There's I think something I'm, quite interesting for all of us everywhere, I guess, being on our own now. You know, we've had eight weeks or so, maybe some have had more, some have had, you know, probably a minimum of eight weeks and there's more to, to come. And this idea of going right back, as you said, to being on your own and you're back at the sort of uh, front line of creating and inventing without the team, without the structures. And we all, many of us work with structures around us and, and support from other people and colleagues. But, um, you know, what has that taught you? I mean, have you've obviously, it allows, I found that it's allowed me to look much deeper into myself and look at kind of where I'm most resourceful, where I'm happiest, what I'm able to adapt to where I can be most agile and then where, where I'm not so agile, where I'm not so flexible. What, what are you finding now in the sort of reflective moments of what you've just put, you know, gone through and may continue to go through for some time? Um, I think probably one of the things that I was surprised about the most was how much I like to be in control and how out of control for the first three, two or three weeks I felt. And I couldn't, 
I found that almost the most difficult bit. Like I realized that my whole, the way I've set up my life and my world is so that I'm totally in control of every part of it. And to, to have that sort of rug pulled from underneath me made me realize how much I rely on it and how fearful I am of it. Right. And then I had to let that go. And I was really shocked at how much I relied on it and then how much I was able to let it go because I didn't think I would... I was so freaked out at first, but I think probably every, everybody was in that way. And then in terms of reflection, definitely um, to be self-sustainable as, an, as, a, as a kind of creator um, rem, was really re, reminded me that I didn't need, you know, that whole thing around me. Like I really, I really felt, it was quite strangely quite, um, a freeing experience to go right well I'm gonna get my kit and I'm gonna go and set up my little studio and then I'm gonna start and I'll be phoning one of my team going so I, this is how I do it right and they're like yeah for the first couple of days I was like so I'm just I'm doing this and they were saying yeah you've pretty much got everything right and I was like oh yeah I can do this can't I I don't I don't so I, that to me was the most um, to kind of tap back into the creativity without all of the layers. You know, so it was responsibility, which was like, I, you know, I, I, I hate that feeling of not being in control, but then kind of regaining it back through my doing it myself. So right, like I wrote a script and I never write scripts, wow. you know, never write scripts. So I wrote a script for a film for like a commercial and I, I'm a bad, I think I'm a really bad writer. So that was, again, you know, like I, just jumping in, I really like, but in terms of re reflection, definitely just take it. I guess, I guess what I did was regain control. You know, I went right, okay. Yeah. And then, and then went, oh, I can do this. I can, I can cope with this. And then ter personally, I think just, I loved slowing down. I really like it. I like, not having to travel all the time so much. Um, I'm not as philosophical, I think, as I was before, but um, I think other people have become more philosophical, I've become more practical. So, I don't know. Lots is gonna come, lots of good will come out of it. I mean, we're all starting to feel that balance between the unknown and the lack of control and regaining control and actually now the virtuous things that we're all experiencing in different ways through this you know this last uh, sort of near near past and I think that hopefully has to be the most important thing that comes out of it that we continue with some of the good behaviors uh, as, as a kind of you know as a, as a global community you know humanity will only be better if everyone can take as much as they've learned in the last few weeks around slowing down around listening around considering the impact we have on our cities, the environment, and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be one of the, I hope, um, positive lessons that comes from what has been, you know, a lot of very, very tough and harsh les lessons for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I really, I really, weirdly, I think what's interesting is going into it, that's kind of where my head was at. So, and there was a part of me kind of thinking, God, like, at the time, I, before it happened, I was thinking, I just think we all need three weeks off and we all knew and then this happened and I was like shit did it you know that kind of like sense yeah. of your own stupidity god I did I wish this on us you know on on everybody but it, I think the hardest thing for me is watching the kids um that are on their own in flats um or the people that have had people pass away um from it that's the bit where I'm like you know, this was, this was preventable, you know, <laughs> yeah. we've, we've, we've driven into this like a, like a car crash and, and I watch them and I'm, I just don't know, I, like, I'm always checking, I was uh, asking people to check in with their mental health, you know, because. Yeah, hundred percent. That worked, I mean, that worked. Know, sort of combination of man's sort of 
irresponsibility and nature's kind of voice coming together going that's it enough you know and hopefully the lessons will be learned i truly believe it's 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 we're being told by the earth not by a god not by anything but by the the, the planet stop <laughs> you know this is a right. warning this is a warning shot and um luckily my head was in that space already so um you know that that to me is just like well we we all it's kind of like if you don't listen we're we're we're, we're really stupid so no. um one final question and then um i will leave you to go and um look through your dried flowers um yeah get back to your book and scripts so here we are all at home um maybe not everyone when they're watching this when it is eventually broadcast but who would you love to photograph in their home right now? Wow, that's a good question. I haven't really thought of anything like that. I mean, I'm, I'm. <laughs> that's really, that's a really good question. I mean, I've, I, when people ask me who I'd like to photograph, I'm always really um, a big believer in, in, in sort of knock i don't chase people so i've never really wanted to chase i always kind of think i kind of it's a bit sad but i love that serendipity when two two people put you a person keep puts you together you know um but obviously when i do the magazine we we have a list of people but at the moment i mean i would i would you know i know it sounds bizarre but i would love to be inside trump's house and photograph him i'm fascinated by that what that, that guy's spiraling out of control and i think it's really interesting to be honest if it was um you know instinctive and off the cuff to shoot a man you know the president of the usa in his house in his white house is a probably quite a good answer actually i hadn't just, thought you'd go there but that's i'm just fascinated by him because i'm you know he he is now officially the most hated person in the world you know it's not <laughs> it's just not even a question now and, and there was a great article the other day where it was like you know we've all had like different emotions about america we some people love it some people hate it some people feel sort of downtrodden by it but they've never felt sorry for it and now we actually are all sitting here, pretty much the whole world, yeah. feeling sorry for America. Yeah. Well, on that slightly um, depressing note for, <laughs> for everyone, um, it's been great talking to you. I appreciate you making the time. I think, um, you know, there's a, a bunch of people out there who are just probably embarking on their careers right now, um, studying at Polymoda in Florence and looking ahead into the world and thinking what kind of you know uh world am i about to step into in terms of careers etc but i think you've provided some really fantastic sort of insights into you know you from where you started where you are now and even this idea of kind of feeling like you're back at you know in control on your own and um that should give everyone plenty of food for thought and hope for the future being you know theirs to write so thank you very much rankin See Thank you. you. Come back to London. Cheers. Cheers.